coming up on Transworld Sport this week. We celebrate the 30th anniversary of our show with a look back at the faces we've seen and the places we've been. We meet the Ironman whose life was changed by watching Transworld Sport. Always champions of the unusual, we discover the urban axe-throwing scene. And the big names always find time for our show as we hang out with surfing king Felipe Toledo. This week, Transworld Sport celebrates its 30th anniversary. For 30 years, we've traveled the globe in search of the best and most interesting stories from the wide world of sport. It's been a quest that's taken us to every continent and to over 190 different countries. We've covered almost every single sport that there is, unearthed some incredible stories, and met some fascinating people along the way. Hey, I'm Mike Tyson, and you're watching Trans World Sports. Don't forget. Hello, I'm Roger Federer. You're watching Trans World Sport. Oh, Trans World Sport. Welcome back to Ethiopia again. Come in. Hello, Trans World Sport. Welcome to casa. This week on Trans World Sports, B. Hola, Trans World Sports. Bienvenidos a Bolivia. On behalf of Trans World Sport and all of its viewers, I'd like to present Carl Lewis with Trans World Sports Trophy for Athlete of the Year and congratulate him for Th such a wonderful season. Thank you, Leroy. It couldn't have come from a better teammate and, of course, a better friend. Hi, I'm Lance Armstrong, Trans World Sports Sportsman of the Year. Mm -hmm great pleasure to accept this award on behalf of my family and certainly my team of Chicago Bulls. Thank you, Trans World Sport. I'm your same boat, the fastest man in the world, and you're watching Trans World Sports. Tune in. <laughs> Usain Bolt was just a babe in arms when Transworld Sport first hit international TV screens 30 years ago. It was 1987, and the world was a very different place. Ronald Reagan and Mikhail Gorbachev were the most powerful men in the world. Communism and the Berlin Wall stood strong. And Nelson Mandela had yet to make his long walk to freedom, with South Africa still under the apartheid system. Argentina's Diego Maradona was at the peak of his powers on the football pitch. And in the boxing ring, a young American heavyweight by the name of Mike Tyson was destroying all comers. It was against this backdrop that Transworld Sport launched in May 1987. From the outset, we've tried to spot emerging talent, and in our early years, we struck gold. Konnichiwa. Bonjour. Hola. Hola. <laughs> hola, yeah, hola. We were the first international TV programme to profile the Williams sisters. Venus was 12 and Serena just 11. Their dad, Richard, revealed to us the ambitions that he had for his young daughters. For both of them to become number one in the world. And right now, I don't see anything that can stop them. I think that they will easily do it. Uh, both girls are going to be tall, they're extremely fast, they have great ground strokes and good volleys. They want to play, and they're very happy girls. Another African-American father whom we met in our early years was Earl Woods. Earl was convinced that his 14-year-old son, Eldrick, also known as Tiger, would one day become the greatest golfer the world has ever seen. The world is ready. It is absolutely ready for a non-white golfer to be successful. Uh, the next booming area in the world for golf is Asia. Tiger is already Asian. He is Thai. Uh, in the United States, Tiger is black. So when he wins in the United States, 
he'll be the first black golfer to win. When he wins a major in, in Asia, he'll be the first Asian to win, you see? So he can't lose unless he doesn't win. And I don't anticipate him not winning. Since I'm black, it might be even bigger than Jack Nicklaus. I might be even bigger than him to the blacks. Um, I may be a, sort of like a Michael Jordan in basketball, or something like that. The list of talented youngsters to have been profiled on Transworld Sport before they became superstars is a very long one. Here's just a selection. How many famous faces can you spot? Whilst we've watched our new faces reach their potential, we've also had the privilege of meeting some sporting legends who are sadly no longer with us. In 2009, we spent time with Spanish golfer Seve Ballesteros as he was battling the cancer that would claim his life. I just want to send a message to all the people that, uh, that are going through uh, uh, difficult times like uh, myself or, or even tougher that, uh, you know, you have to fight. You have to fight, you have to be strong, uh, because at the end, you know, and if you overcome the situation and you win, you know, you know, when you win, it tastes much uh, sweeter. So please fight and fight, never stop. Other legendary figures to have allowed the Transworld Sport cameras into their lives include Dutch track and field star Fanny Blankers Coombe and Australian cricket great Don Bradman. In his later life, Bradman was notoriously reclusive, so we were honoured to be welcomed into his Adelaide home. Hungarian footballer Ferenc Pushkash and Argentinian motor racing driver Juan Manuel Fangio also graced this show with their presence. as did American boxer Joe Frazier. I want people to remember me, you know, as a great fighter, a great person, uh, a great guy that get the job. In our 30 years, the biggest name to have appeared on Transworld Sport is unquestionably Frazier's great rival, Muhammad Ali. Despite his health problems, the greatest turned up in person to accept our Athlete of the Century Award in December 1999. Along with the famous faces that have appeared on Transworld Sport, a big part of our show has been the places that we've journeyed to and the traditional sports that we've discovered there. Places like Papua New Guinea, Laos, Cuba, Madagascar, Mongolia, Iraq, Nepal, Somalia and Burkina Faso. Sports like Samo wrestling, kabaddi, yak polo and buffalo racing. Here at Transworld Sport, we like to think that we go to places where others won't. Out of the 206 member nations of the IOC, we've been to 193 of them, and we're aiming to visit the remaining ones in the near future. In the early 90s, we headed to North Korea. We were one of the first international sports shows to visit the secretive state. At that time, the country was under the rule of their great leader, Kim Il-sung. In Pyongyang, we reported on the DPRK sports system and were even invited to film at the Arirang Mass Games, where celebrations for Kim Il-sung's 80th birthday were in full swing. Shortly after filming in North Korea, Transworld Sport was visited by Western intelligence agencies, keen to know what we'd seen in the country. Following the overthrow of the Taliban in 2001, we returned to Afghanistan for the first time since the late 80s. We got reacquainted with the brutal national sport of Buskashi. One of the world's oldest sports with few rules, it's a reflection of the violence and power struggles that have scarred Afghanistan for centuries. 
Perhaps the most significant lesson that our travels have taught us is how important sport can be as a vehicle for peace and understanding. A few years after the genocide in Rwanda, which left over one million people dead, we reported on the role that sport was playing in helping to rebuild a shattered nation. Sporting programs were being introduced across the country to encourage social change, as Rwanda's president explained to us. Sport alone cannot uh, bring about the healing the society needs like ours. Uh, but that has to be done in combination with other efforts. But uh, what is important to stress here is that sport has its own place, has its own role to play in, in bringing together the society, in hearing the minds of people, in focusing on it uh, as something that uh, brings people together, even in a competition, it brings them together. We've also seen how sport can help to preserve cultures around the world. A favorite annual event of ours is the World Eskimo Indian Olympics, where native Alaskan games celebrate aspects of a rapidly vanishing way of life. Although the games may look a little strange, the skills displayed date back thousands of years and were once necessary for the survival of native Alaskans. It hurts for a while, but then it gets numb. Then it, after a while, you know, it doesn't hurt anymore. The weird and wonderful things that people do around the globe in the name of sport remains a key feature of this program. Transworld Sport has spent 30 years celebrating them all and will continue to do so in the years ahead. Now it's time to test your knowledge with our sporting question. This week, the 100th edition of cycling's Giro d'Italia gets underway. One of the favorites for the Maglia Rosa, the pink jersey worn by the race leader, is Vincenzo Nibali, who claimed victory last year. Born in Messina, where the fifth stage will finish, Nibali is one of just six cyclists to have won all three of cycling's grand tours, the Vuelta a España, the Tour de France, and the Giro. The 32-year-old is chasing his third Giro triumph this year and will be cheered on by a home crowd eager to see an Italian triumph in the race of centenary. Since the 100th edition of the Giro coincides with Transworld Sports 30th anniversary, for this week's question, we'd like you to name the rider that won the race when Transworld Sport was just starting out in 1987. We'll bring you the answer later in the show. Like you never try. Very like primal throwing weapons. It's kind of a bit of a release. Everybody wants to try the new thing, and at the moment, axe throwing is it. Competitive axe throwing is the latest craze sweeping the underground sports scene in Great Britain. Conceived in the backyards of Canada, this game originated from lumberjacks slinging axes at wooden planks for fun. Word soon spread, and the recreational activity became a tool for bringing communities together. For over 10 years, axe throwing has remained a well-kept secret amongst the Canadians, but not anymore. 
When we first caught wind that urban axe throwing was a thing that was possible to do, we were just, yeah, we were really hooked on the idea. Uh, we saw that it was getting big over in Canada and we thought, actually, we need to give this a go. And so we set up a target, tried it out ourselves, tried a few different techniques, and um, the minute we started getting the hang of it and sinking some axes, realised this is amazingly satisfying, like it's really, really fun. Yeah, start, start getting some, some customers in and start trying to build a community over here as well. Whistle Punk's Urban Axe Throwing is the first indoor venue to open across the Atlantic. The aim of the game is to plant steel axes within the target zones. A bullseye will get you five points, with the outer ring securing three and one respectively. Hit the two top corners and you'll be awarded a maximum seven points. Competitors go head-to-head -head with five throws each per game, and whoever racks up the most points overall is the winner. Whistlepunk's co-founders Jules Whitehorn and John Nimmons thought that the hip streets of East London would make the perfect home. London, I think, fits the, the urban requirement of it very well as, as well. That was actually part of what drew us to it, was that axe throwing is something that you can go and out, out and do in a field, an outdoor centre, or somewhere away from the city. Um, but urban axe throwing is really kind of bringing it in, making it a sort of team competitive sport and an experience that most people don't get in the city. Yet the duo still paid tribute to the game's traditional roots. Whistle Punk is actually the name for a lumberjack who's just starts on his first day. This is back in the day, a long time ago in, in Canada. And um, because it was his first day, they wouldn't give him an axe. They'd um, put him onto the steam engine, which dragged the logs around, and he'd be manning the whistle. So we thought, you know what, that's, uh, that's quite a nice time with what we're doing. And yeah, so Whistle Punk was born. But despite the lumberjack stereotypes, it seems that the key to the game isn't all brawn and muscle. One of the great things about axe throwing is that uh, it's all about skill. So, you know, you'll have massive stacked guys turn up, think they're going to be really good at this, and they'll, they just won't get it. Um, and, you know, you'll have, have some quite small women turn up and they'll be nailing those bullseyes every time the satisfaction you'll get when you actually sink that axe is, is something really, really special. And you, you can see it in the, in the games when people get their first bullseye, they're literally jumping around with a big grin on their face. It's really, really satisfying. Appealing to a wide audience is just one of the reasons behind Whistle Punk's burgeoning success. The social atmosphere and opportunity to de-stress by burying the hatchet has had many coming back for more. But learning how to throw the axe safely and effectively is tricky. You're trying to get the right amount of movement. You're trying to keep your axe from wobbling or twisting. If you can keep it steady and throw forwards, you get the right spin and get it in. Simple as that. Our goal is to try and bring this to as many places around the UK and beyond as possible. Um, we've set up the European Axe Throwing Association so that we can kind of tie it together and try and give it a bit of credibility as an actual sport. And so we're hoping that uh, by bringing the leagues and tying them together and sort of unifying it, we can, um, we can get a real community uh, of axe throwers and, and uh, some real credibility to the sport. Game on. Love to compete in an axe throwing competition. It's so good. I would quite like to, uh, to play like the Germans or the French axe throwing. I think that could be pretty cool. Put lumberjack shirts at home and big boots, so yeah, give it a go. We'll see the mistake. Yeah. <laughs> if we make it to the semi finals, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I've got a higher top score than Jules, so I'm uh, pretty, pretty hopeful that I'll, uh, yeah, I'll beat him in the league as well. Of the hundred people who played on this day, it was George Deegan who came out on top. I think what won for me was consistency. Everyone else is getting like bullseyes all the time, but I was just getting kind of hitting it very consistently, so it's good fun. Axe throwing is a game that seems to be hitting the spot. The first of our top fives this week looks at some more unusual sports we've featured over the years.
First up is the British sport of gurning. The objective for those taking part is to pull the ugliest face possible whilst wearing a horse collar. Gurning is said to date back to the 13th century when a village idiot would be rewarded with ale for pulling funny faces. Next is volcano boarding. In Nicaragua, thrill seekers reach speeds of up to 60 kilometers per hour as they slide down the black cinder slopes of the active Cerro Negro volcano. The traditional Japanese sport of botaoshi loosely translates as pole pull down. Botaoshi is played by two teams of 150 players, 75 attackers and 75 defenders. The aim of the game is to pull the opposing team's pole down before they can accomplish the same feat. In Yemen, camel jumping remains a popular pastime amongst the Zaranik tribe. Competitors are required to jump from a ramp made of hard-packed mud and dried reeds to a landing area positioned behind up to six camels. The man who jumps the furthest wins. And finally, sepak bola api, or fireball soccer. Played in Indonesia, the ball is made from coconut fiber and is doused in diesel before being set alight. The game loosely follows the regular laws of soccer, with heading, chesting, throw-ins and tackles all allowed. Felipe Toledo is one of the planet's leading surfers. His pure speed and electrifying aerials have been shaking up surfing's championship tour for the last four years. We caught up with the 22-year-old Brazilian ahead of the 2017 season. Felipe hails from the coastal city of Ubatuba in southern Brazil. He caught his first wave at just 10 months old and was surfing on a regular basis by the time he was four. Felipe's father, Ricardo, was also a professional surfer and a three-time Brazilian champion. He went on to become a surfing instructor and helped guide his son through board riding's ranks. These days, Ricardo travels with Felipe on the World Surf League's Championship Tour. He's still very influential in my life today. He's always related his own experiences as a professional surfer and shown me how to handle things both in and out of the water. Things like the competitions, the pressure and the commitment. Having him with me gives me an advantage over my competitors. So it's great that he's around as a dad and a coach to pass on his knowledge and experience. From the moment he started surfing, I realized that he could read waves very well and that he really enjoyed learning more and more about the whole process. He'd study other surfers, his brother, friends and the older guys out there. And he always wanted to be like them and try to do what they were doing, even though he was still very young. In 2014, the Toledos moved from Brazil to the USA to help boost Felipe's career and give their other children greater opportunities. The quintessential California surf town, San Clemente, is located midway between Los Angeles and San Diego. In addition to being a premier board riding destination, San Clemente also boasts a large number of surfboard manufacturers and is recognized as the media capital of the surfing world. When we arrived here, it was a real culture shock for my family. I was already used to being in the USA and spending time away from home. 
But they had to learn English, a new language for them, and adapt to a new culture, a whole American way of life. It was very different from the life in Brazil that they'd been used to. The family, including Felipe's partner Ananda, has settled in well. But there's still the occasional domestic hiccup. <laughs> Toledo made a major breakthrough amidst surfing senior ranks while still a teenager. The US Open of surfing is the richest event in the sport. It takes place at Huntington Beach, a few miles up the coast from San Clemente, and over the years has developed into a celebration of beach culture and action sports. It attracts the great and the good from the surfing industry, as well as the world's best board riders from the men's and women's tours. In 2014 event, Felipe showcased his small wave wizardry in tricky, inconsistent surf. He defeated all comers to claim what was then the biggest win of his career. When I won the US Open for the first time in 2014, it was a very important victory for me. I was coming back from injury and had been struggling to perform well. But I arrived at that event very focused, very determined and I ended up winning it. That gave me a lot of confidence for future competitions. The following year, Felipe came close to winning the world title. He finished the season fourth overall after claiming three tour victories, one of which came on home waters in Brazil. Rio is definitely the event that I'll always remember, the best of my life. The beach was absolutely packed, and my whole family was there, more than 30 of them, as well as loads of my friends. I think there were more than 40,000 people that came down to the beach for the final. It was a feeling that I'll never forget. The 2016 season proved less memorable. Toledo's title charge was derailed at the year's opening competition, where he sustained a groin injury that sidelined him for the following two events. As a result, Felipe intensified his focus on fitness. He works with Rai Steinhoff at Foundation Fit, who's developed a surf-specific program that concentrates on core training, strength over body weight and endurance. Back at base, we discovered why the Toledos keep their cars parked on the driveway. So, here in the garage, I've got quite a few boards. And one of my favourites for surfing smaller waves is this one. It's a 5.4 Sharp Eye, shaped by Marcio Zovi, a Brazilian guy who's lived here for over 30 years. This board's a lot of fun in small waves. There are two big fins either side and a smaller stabilizing fin in the middle. So it's very small but perfectly formed. It's a modern two model, one of the best of its kind. And you're pretty much guaranteed to have fun on it. Family has always been central to the Toledo's way of life. And in October of last year, Felipe himself became a father. Talk commitments meant that Felipe was competing in Portugal when the baby was due, but an online video link allowed him to witness Ananda giving birth to their daughter Mahina before returning home to assume his fatherly duties. Yeah, it's been amazing. It was pretty tiring at first, but everything you go through all becomes worthwhile when you see your baby smiling and when you see that they're happy. It spurs me on every time I'm out in the water competing, thinking about my daughter and my new family. I really want to give my very best for them. 
Between battling injury and becoming a father, Felipe faced some significant challenges away from competition last season. True to character, he embraced them all and still managed to finish the year ranked 10th on the championship tour. 2016 also proved highly significant in the wider board riding world as it was confirmed that surfing would make its debut as an Olympic sport in Japan. To have surfing at the 2020 Olympics in Tokyo will be something very special for our sport and also for us as pro surfers and of course for our sponsors too. I can't imagine what it would feel like to actually be there and be competing for an Olympic gold medal. A unique experience, for sure. Long considered the best small wave rider in the world, Felipe has worked hard to develop the technical skills, physical fitness and mental strength to excel in all conditions. As a result, he's become a more rounded performer and has posted some solid results at the tour's bigger wave venues, such as Fiji and Hawaii. Now injury-free and with the birth of his daughter behind him, Felipe will once again be a serious contender for the world title in 2017. An athlete can be in perfect shape physically, surfing amazingly well, and have great boards. But if he's not in the right emotional state and not focused on what he needs to do, then everything falls apart and comes to nothing. So things will happen in their own time, and I think we're working towards that and going about it the right way. The title will come, and it will come when the time is right. Ever since I was a kid, my father always told me, go and have fun, be happy and enjoy what you're doing. And I still have that mindset. I don't worry too much about having to get good results. I always have fun when I'm surfing because I'm doing what I love. And so far, it's brought me some pretty good results. <laughs> the second of our top fives features some more young talent we've profiled recently. <laughs> Seventeen year old Miomir Kekmanovic is the world's number one ranked junior tennis player. The Serb, who trains in Florida, has already made an impact on a handful of senior tournaments, and he's being hailed as the next Novak Djokovic. Hever Arnaton is a 14-year-old rising star of the track and field world. Hailing from France, she excels in the long jump and the sprint. Last year, the youngster set a new world record for her age group with an incredible leap of 6 meters 57. America's Richard Matty has been called the greatest young fighter in the world. Now 18, he's a junior Olympic boxing champion, a world kickboxing champ, and he's won countless national titles in grappling, wrestling, jiu-jitsu, and Muay Thai. He's also outstanding at MMA. US sprinter Candace Hill is set to be a major force in athletics in the next few years. The 18-year-old is a two-time junior world champion and has a personal best of 10.98 for the 100 meters and 22.43 for the 200. And the final youngster to keep an eye out for is Indian cricket sensation Prithvi Shaw. He's just turned 17 and has been smashing scoring records back in his homeland. He's regarded as the most exciting talent to emerge from India since the great Sachin Tendulkar. And now for the answer to this week's sporting question. Earlier in the show, we asked you to name the cyclist who won the Giro d'Italia in 1987, the year when Transworld Sport first hit TV screens. The answer is Stephen Roach.
The Irishman clinched victory after controversially attacking teammate Roberto Vicentini in the mountains. Later that year, he became the second cyclist behind Eddie Merckx to clinch the Triple Crown when he sealed victory in the Tour de France and Road Race World Championship. After retiring from the sport in 1993, Stephen opened a hotel and he's also worked in the media, commentating on professional races featuring his son Nicholas Roach and nephew Dan Martin, who have both won stages at Grand Tours. Transworld Sport, it literally saved my life. Without it, I wouldn't be the man that I am today. Sport's given me salvation, it's given me focus. It's realigned that energy and that focus in my body to achieve something positive. I was always a sort of very driven kid. But when I was growing up, the sort of role models that I had in my life were all engaged in organised crime. and so I disregarded my education and I made the decision at quite a young age that that was the road I was going to end up travelling down. I bought my first sawn off shotgun at 16 years old. Then the inevitable happened and I was arrested at 18 years old and then got two life sentences. I started exercising in my prison cell to break up the monotony of being locked up for 24 hours a day. And that is how I found sport and ultimately redemption. 34-year-old John McAvoy was destined to lead a life of crime. Born in South London into a family steeped in armed robbery and drug trafficking, the McAvoy name carries weight in the British criminal underworld. Having committed a string of armed robberies, McAvoy spent more than a decade in prison. But with a helping hand from this very show, sport enabled John to leave that life behind and is now an Ironman athlete. When he isn't training or competing, John also gives talks to youngsters to warn of the dangers in following the criminal path he once chose. This is the Englishman's incredible life story. And I'll set three world records. I was held as a Category A prisoner, which was very unheard of in the United Kingdom for such a young aged prisoner. And then I, I spent the next 365 days, the next year of my life, locked in this tiny segregation cell. And that's where the process of my training actually started taking hold. And I started getting into a routine of training every single day. So I used to do a thousand burpees, a thousand press ups, a thousand squat thrusts, and a thousand sit ups every day. Five years into his prison sentence, and McAvoy was still an entrenched career criminal, showing little inclination to leave that lifestyle behind. It took the death of his best friend, who died in a car crash during a getaway from a robbery, to change John's attitude to a life of crime. That moment changed my life forever. And it made me look at my own mortality and the fact that I was sitting in this cell and like you've only got one chance at life. And I had just spent nearly a decade at that, to that point rotting in a cell and I'd done nothing positive at all with my life. And I just said, I, I knew from that night onwards I'd never in my life commit a crime again. I knew I wouldn't. As John began moving down the prison ranks to lower category jails, he was granted more gym access. Like many inmates, he used the gym as a form of escapism removing himself from the monotony of being locked up. Desperate to find a career away from the criminal world, but with no direction, McAvoy immersed himself in his training. It was at Loudham Jail in Nottinghamshire where John would meet prison gym officer Darren Davis. Eight years on, Darren remains a close confidant to John. Whilst in prison, Darren helped nurture John's natural talent and gave him the opportunity to push his limits through rowing. Without Darren, even though I could have had all the potential in the world, without Darren seeing that in me and guiding me and opening up my eyes to it, I wouldn't be sitting here today in front of you competing in Ironman, sponsored by Nike. That was all because that one man saw something in me, and not just my athletic ability, but he saw the fact that I wanted to do something else with my life, 
and he encouraged me to do it. He offered me support and he was probably one of the first people in my life to ever do that. It was through his rigorous cell routine and gym training that John learned to push through the pain barrier and he developed an incredible stamina. With the help of prison officer Darren Davis, he went on to break several British and three world indoor rowing records. John remains the only lightweight rower to hold all three endurance world records simultaneously. I had woke up a billet in my body and a gift that I never even realised I had. Everything I craved as a little kid, when I broke that first record, I was like, wow, this is everything I've ever wanted. And then from that moment onwards, I knew then that I could use sport as a vehicle to break me out of that life. I knew I could use my body as a way and something I could do in my life to achieve the things I always wanted to achieve. In 2009, John watched an episode of Transworld Sport and this program would help to shape his future. Regarded as one of the toughest tests in modern sport. The extreme event features a 3.8 kilometre swim, a 180 kilometre bike ride, followed by a full marathon. I was on the rowing machine and I was um, I watched an episode of Transworld Sport on the TV in the, in the prison gym, and I watched these amazing athletes and it, it was incredible. Like watching these guys doing what I, at that moment in my life, thought was just phenomenal, phenomenal thing of being able to run a marathon after cycling for 180 kilometers. And they were like superhumans. And it inspired me just from watching that one episode that one day in my life that I'd want to take up and do an Ironman. Three years after John saw that Ironman feature on Transworld Sport, the prison parole board released him on a life license. He'd vowed to turn his back on crime and with world record indoor rowing times, he helped to turn professional. To help him achieve that goal, John approached the prestigious London Rowing Club on the banks of London's River Thames. Yet six months on, his dreams of becoming a professional rower were dashed. John's indoor rowing times were up with the elite, but having never rowed on water until his release, his technique made him a strong amateur at best. He'd simply taken up rowing too late in life. So once I realised that I couldn't make a career as a professional athlete out of rowing, um, watching that episode of Transworld Sport those years before and having that sport in my mind, when I started researching it and I realised that you can turn professional at the sport at any age, you've just got to prove to the powers that be um, of Ironman that you can race the sport professionally because you're fast enough. So I made the decision, that is what I'm going to do. I'm going to pursue a career and try to turn, turn professional or will turn professional at the sport of Ironman. Still training to this day at the London Rowing Club, John enjoys the atmosphere and camaraderie between fellow athletes. Hi, mate. Yeah, yeah, carbs are a bit tight still. Olympic hopefuls train here alongside judges, lawyers and other high-functioning members of society. When he first joined, no one knew John's story. Yet after he decided to open up about his criminal past, he was still accepted by the club and its members. When my past came out, within not just the rowing club, but within the rowing world, so this is British rowing, uh, this, is, this went up to, all the way to like the, the sort of Olympic squad. The response that I received from the sport was, was incredible and it was, it, was, it was unbelievable heartwarming, like the, the support that I received from the whole rowing community and especially London Rowing Club where I was a member at. It broke preconceptions of what other people believed people like me would have been like. After initially hiding from his past, John has gone on to embrace it. He now visits schools telling his story. I completely disregarded my education at that point. At 14 years old, I started truing it from school. Um, I had no respect for my teachers, none, none whatsoever. My mum pleaded with me to go and do my GCSEs because at that point she knew she had done everything she could to shield me from that life. She knew I hope when they listen to me talk that I demonstrate to them it doesn't matter where you are in your life, your path isn't always mapped out for you, that you don't need to be a product of your environment like I was as a kid. And if I can stop one kid 
going down the road that I did as a little kid, I'd be a happy man. And it would mean more to me than winning any race in the world or any of the records that I've ever done or anything I continue to do the rest of my life. If I can stop one of those kids spending one day in prison, like I did, looking up to the wrong role models in life, everything I do is worth it. Away from his motivational talks, John remains focused on one thing, and that's becoming a professional Ironman athlete. The suffering is, I need to prove myself. When I first come out of prison, I felt like, I felt like a loser. I felt like I lost a lot of my life, 10 years of my life for a dream that didn't exist. I felt like I didn't do anything with my life in that time and I was, I was so committed to achieving something the rest of my life. To me, it's about proving to myself that I wasn't just a loser in life. I don't think there's anything harder than doing an Ironman triathlon. The fact of getting off your bike after 180K and then running a full marathon as hard as you can, like running into that pain, um, I enjoy it. I, I think that's the part where it's a test. So how much do you want this? Um, because it is going to hurt, it, it does hurt. You, you feel like you're running on fumes, there's nothing left. I, I prepare myself to run myself into the ground. No matter how much it hurts, I won't stop. Over the four Ironman events that John has competed in, his times have improved dramatically. Currently competing in the amateur field, his times are now comparable to many on the professional circuit. John is on the cusp of making his dream a reality. My goals this year are to turn professional. I want to get a pro Ironman licence. It was my dream in 2009 on that rowing machine that I wanted to be a pro athlete. But what I've come to realise over the last sort of year, year and a half of my life, I want to go into schools and I want to show those children with that card and say, that card is a pro athlete that you can achieve your dreams in life. And that means more to me now than actually race wins. And I'm driven every single day of my life to do that. Every, every, everything I do and everywhere, all the decisions that I make today are all based around how many people I could potentially help in the future. Through sport, John McAvoy has found a career and a purpose away from a life of crime. And although his own personal road to redemption is far from over, he's certainly on the right path and we at Transworld Sport are happy to have played a role in his story. Coming soon on the show, we catch up with British Olympic canoeing champion Joe Clark. And we're in Bulgaria with the teenage twins making an impact on the football pitch. Don't forget you can keep up to date with us on Twitter, Facebook and YouTube.